Good morning and welcome to worship today. I'm glad that all of you are here on this beautiful Sunday morning in which to worship our Lord. Just a few words of announcements. First of all, welcome to all of you who are our guests today. We're always delighted to have you in our midst and I hope that you will find this church home welcoming and a place you'd love to be from now on. We'd love to have you here. Again, thank you for being here this morning. Please sign the attendance register as it's in the black folders close to the center aisle that we can have a record of your worship with us today. There will be no youth this afternoon. The men will, will meet at 7 as usual. On Wednesday night this week, blast the women's Bible study and choir will be going on as usual. This afternoon at 4 o'clock, there's a special concert at, uh, at Hopewell Church, and Rick Sakel has asked uh, to invite this congregation to come join them there for that, uh, that concert at 4 p.m. If you can do that, well, I know you would be much welcome there. Men, please remember the United Methodist men meet for breakfast next Saturday morning at, at 8 a.m. The flowers that you see on the altar this morning are, are a special occasion. They uh, honor the birth of Mara Salish Sleister, the first grandchild of uh, Joni and Mike. So we, we congratulate them. Also, we're uh, happy to congratulate Olivia Gray and Logan Carter, who were married yesterday, both of the members of this church down in Savannah. And so uh, we welcome, we will welcome them back as a married couple. Again, welcome to all of you. I hope that you will notice several announcements there in the back of the bulletin, particularly the one that relates to next Sunday being All Saints Day. If someone in your family has passed away since November of, of last year and you would like to have them remembered, please let us know at the church office. Fill out the, the uh, tear out in the back of the bulletin. And if you have a, a photograph that we can share next Sunday morning as their names are called, we would like to have it so that we can put it on the screen. Let's join together now in the singing of our, our first hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be.
us affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sit at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This year, our stewardship journey has a theme, Seed Planted. How does your faith instruct you? The guide for our stewardship journey, the chair of, of the stewardship committee, is, is Bill Brothers. And he's going to say a few words to us now about the beginning of this stewardship journey this fall. Bill? Watch those mics, almost got right in the head. Um, good morning. Morning. Oh, that was pretty good. You all had coffee, didn't you? <laughs> I could tell. Um, as you heard, Ed, we have our theme that you heard, um, and it really came from Bishop uh, Robin that was here a couple weeks ago with the consecration of Dean Hall. And we both thought that really fed into our stewardship uh, journey and our season right now. But it got me to thinking is, what does stewardship mean to me? And so I went and looked in scripture for something that would talk to me about stewardship. And I found 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. And it reads, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in various forms. Isn't that great? To serve others. This is what stewardship is, is to serve others. Now, in the early service, I, poor Ed, I, I kind of took his ministry away from him. I said, this is our ministry. This is why we donate. This is why we give. This is our ministry to reach out to our neighbors and our community around us. We got this beautiful new Dean Hall that was just consecrated. That is gonna be part of our outreach. That is what's gonna bring the community in. That is how we're gonna serve our neighbors. This is why we give. We donate to so many other ministries. Wellroot, Wesley Wood, right? We have so many ministries in here that we all participate in. Music ministry, right? Men's group, women's group, men's Bible group. We have so many that we, we, we have in here. This is why we need to donate to our ministry here for Lanier. Let me give you a quote from uh, the book, The Generation Church, The Generous Church uh, from Tom Berlin. And this really hit home with me. People will embrace giving if they believe their gifts are used in the community and the world to further the mission of Christ. That is stewardship. That is why we give. It's not just to build buildings. It's to build relationships. It's to build a ministry for Christ. So you're gonna get your pledge cards in the mail or they're gonna be out in the kiosk. When you pick up that card, when you look at that card, I want you to pray over that card. I want you to discern what God is telling you to give. <coughs> Look at that card, pray over that card, 
Whatever God lays on your heart, I want you to write onto that card. That is stewardship. That's giving to the ministry. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you on this gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous day, and we thank you for waking us up to be part of it. You have blessed us so greatly. Now warm our hearts with generosity. Let us discern over what to give for stewardship. Lord, it is up to you to tell us what to give for this ministry that you are guiding us through. We ask all of this and give you thanks and praise in your son's name. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Thank you, Bill. Let's join together now in moments of silent prayer and, and meditation as we prepare for the morning prayer. Almighty God, you're the creator of this day and all its beauty. You breathe the breath of life into us and have enabled us to care for this, your creation. On this Reformation Sunday, we express gratitude to you for the reformers who in their unwavering faith and dedication brought renewal and transformation to your church. We praise you for their commitment to your word and their desire to see your truth proclaimed boldly and clearly. We lift before you, O oh God, all those who suffer for their faith around the world. Comfort them, give them courage and insight that your truth might prevail. We rejoice, Lord, in your healing presence in our midst. Thank you for bringing members of our church family and community through surgery well. We praise you for how healing of body and mind has come to others. Great physician, guide the hands of surgeons and give wisdom to doctors who treat those who anticipate surgery and test soon. We pray for peace in the Middle East and in the Ukraine. Protect all those who are at risk and in harm's way. And still in all the decision makers and understanding of the immense value of human life. Call us to unity as Christian people. Make those words our Father, a part of our consciousness as we pray the prayer our Lord taught us saying, Our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Again, welcome to all of you here today. It's, it's wonderful to have several guests, and we're delighted that you've come to Lanier this morning. We, we're missing several of our folks today, for some for travel and, and quite a few for sickness, I'm afraid. And so uh, we uh, pray that they will get to feeling better soon and join us again really often. Remembering the words of our Lord, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Let's worship God now with our tithes and our offerings.
you look at my hat. What is it? Halloween. Halloween. Right. Um, are you going to go trick or treating on Halloween? So let's ask these people, because they look a little old for Halloween, but they might. Let's just stand up and okay? This is an interactive activity. All right. Raise your hand if you're going trick-or-treating on Tuesday night. Just for people. Okay. That was all I had to ask y'all. Y'all can just still stay away. Okay. Um, so on Halloween, uh, people dress up in... Costumes. Um, so what are you going to dress up as? Wednesday. Oh. Oh. That's a day of the week. Oh. Wednesday. Please. Oh, Wednesday. Wednesday. Yes. Character from <coughs> the Adam's family. I know that. Okay. Well, um, on Halloween, people dress up in costumes. Like you're going to dress up like Wednesday. And I think um, some people are going to dress up like Thursday or Friday. I don't know. But anyway. Um, and we dress up because we're going to get candy. That's really nice. But um, what I was thinking about is on Halloween, people dress up and pretend like they're somebody else. But what I was thinking about when we think about Christians is that sometimes... Some of us may act like we are so full of Jesus. Hi, I love you too. Yes, I love your outfit. And then, when they're not there, it's like, you know, I can't stand her. Every time I see her, she's like, baby, baby. I don't even know what that baby, baby means, but that would mean that we are not really being very much like Jesus, are we? If we say one thing to their face and then we say something mean about them behind of their face, that's a bad trick, isn't it? That's not anything we're going to do. So today we're just going to remember that um, we want to be true to Jesus wherever we are. We don't want to wear a disguise and act like we love Jesus but then act bad later. So let's uh, say a prayer. You ready? Uh, dear God, thank you so much for every person that is here. And we ask you, Lord, to give us grace and forgiveness when we don't act like we should. Um, and we ask that you bring special blessings on everyone here today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> <laughs>
The scripture reading today is from Matthew 22, 34 to 46. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together and one of them asked an expert in the law, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And this is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the laws and the prophets. Now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, How is it then that David, by the Spirit, calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Joyce. Again, what a delight to welcome all of you today. Let's pray together. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. The scriptures tell us that the Pharisees came up to Jesus and said of the 613 commandments given in the Torah and the hundreds more elaborated by our rabbis, out of all of these precepts guiding our lives, which is the most important? Can we rank them? Is there one that is more important or must we remember and obey all of them equally? Now I can imagine that most, if not all of you, have felt the taste, test of weighty questions from time to time in, in your life. Is it more important to be truthful or to be kind? As a Christian, am I primarily supposed to, to care for and be kind to others? Or am I strictly supposed to stand up for my beliefs and the Lordship of Jesus Christ? How does all this work? I'm sure that you noticed that Jesus didn't condemn the Pharisees for asking him the question. Their intent was, was to trap him, but it seemed that he welcomed the debate. King Duncan suggested that if you've ever sweated through a, a job interview, then you know, you know what it's like to hold your breath as you wait for the next question. Will it be something off the wall that you can't possibly answer? Or will it be a perfectly reasonable question, the one that will cause your mind to go blank the very minute the interviewer asks it? There's a story about a, a young woman who was interviewing for admission into a prestigious business school. The head professor began the interview. We can ask you 10 easy questions, he said, or one really difficult question. Choose carefully what you want. The woman thought a moment, I'd like to answer one really difficult question. The professor scowled, okay, if that's your choice. He said uh, to her, and then he asked, which comes first, day or night? Which comes first, day or night? The second, seconds ticked by while the young woman pondered her answer. She looked up with a smile and said, the day comes first. 
And why would you say that? The professor asked. Sir, the young woman said, you gave me a choice and assured me that I wouldn't need to answer a second difficult question. <laughs> you know, the Bible passage today, as it did last week, and the question about paying taxes reveals that the religious leaders were asking difficult questions, not because they wanted real answers, but because they wanted to trap Jesus. They wanted him to look foolish. They wanted him to be less popular among the Jewish people. The expert in the law of, of Moses asked, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment of all? No matter what he answers, he's going to neglect some part of God's law. Then they can pounce on him for his ignorance of the law. Or they can uh, think about his arrogance and thinking that a mere man can make such judgments about God's law. There's a cartoon about a, a monk sitting at a, a big desk in, in a monastery. The monk is filing papers by placing them in one of three baskets on his desk. The first of the baskets said secular. The second basket said sacred. And the third basket said top sacred. Well, the religious leaders were trying to get Jesus to choose which law is top sacred in God's order of righteous living. But Jesus doesn't take the bait. Instead, he takes them back to the very foundation of God's laws. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Now, I'm afraid that had I been one asking that question, I would have zeroed in on them with another cutting question. Why do you think that love for the law should be important than love for God and love of your neighbor? Why? Charlie Reed, who was pastor down at Johns Creek, our, our neighbor for several years, said, living out our faith in this messy world can be difficult. It's easy to lose our way. This is why from time to time we need to find true north of our faith. A compass always points to magnetic north to help us travel in the right direction. The good news is Jesus gave us true north in his teachings. When we're lost and confused, all we have to do is to remember Jesus' most important lesson here and we can get back on the right path again. We get lost when we forget this lesson from Jesus. We can study the Bible and still get lost. We can go to worship every week and get lost. We can follow the rules and behave and still get lost. We can look religious, keep our noses clean and follow all 10 of the commandments and still miss who God is and what God's desire is for us. Can't you imagine that Jesus' answer was revolutionary to them? He quoted from Deuteronomy and from Leviticus. You want to sum it up, he asked? Okay, love God and love other people. The Pharisees' jaws must have, have dropped for they dedicated their lives to interpreting and debating these 613 laws. And along comes this carpenter from Nazareth who wraps them all up in one sentence. Their focus on the minute details didn't draw them closer to God or God's children. They had good intentions, but clearly they had lost their way. You recall how the Pharisees chastised Jesus for breaking a dietary law. He put it in perspective for them. He said, it's not what you eat that makes you unclean, but what comes out of your mouth that destroys your cleanliness. Too many Christians get lost putting rules, <coughs> doctrines, theology, and judgments over loving God and, and neighbor. They start with good intentions. They take a stand and express their position. 
But often over time, their positions or theology or ideas become more important than their relationship with God and God's children. There's a song that has been sung at numerous retreats and in many worship services called One in the Spirit. Do you remember the lyrics of, of that song? It goes, we are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that all unity one day may be restored. And the chorus continued, and they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Jesus said that people will know we are His followers not by our hatred, not by our judgments, not by our theology, not by pride, not by our interpretation of Scripture, but by our love for one another. In heaven, God's not going to say to us, well done, you were correct in how you read the Song of Solomon. Well done, you were part of my favorite denomination. Well done, your theology was right on. No, God is ready to say, well done. You loved me with all your heart and likewise loved my children. The greatest commandment does not contain the words, don't or thou shalt not. It's not about what we don't do. You know, if it were, I'd feel comfortable walking over here to, to Beaver Toyota and saying to the general manager, put me on your payroll. I do you no harm. I don't sell Hondas. <laughs> it's about doing what we can to love God and to love our neighbors, to love all of God's children, even those we don't like. Followers of Christ are not worried about what they should do. They want to do what they can for God and to allow God to work through them. Followers of Christ are not known for what they are against, but what they are for. Jesus understood the love law to be love-based rather than rules-based. He did all sorts of things throughout his ministry where the scribes and the Pharisees reason that he'd broken the law he reached out and touched a leper even though the rule said keep away keep away he healed on the sabbath day even when the rules prevented it the sabbath was made for us he said not us for the sabbath he ate and drank with tax collectors and sinners even though the rules discouraged it he befriended foreigners like samaritans even though they played by a different set of rules than did Jesus. Love rather than rule keeping was at the heart of Jesus' faith. A new Christian, a young man, was so excited about his new faith that he began praying to God to allow him to share that faith. He wasn't very educated or sophisticated. So he was surprised when God led him to share his faith with a brilliant attorney. When he attempted to talk to him about his faith, the attorney simply laughed at him. He challenged him at every turn. He laid arguments out about the existence of God, about the divinity of, of Jesus. The new Christian was clearly in over his head. He couldn't answer the questions. He felt ashamed for failing at his mission. But before he left the attorney, he said simply, I want you to know that I came here today because I love you. Well, he went home feeling like a failure. He shut himself up in a room. A few hours later, the attorney came knocking at his door. The man's wife tried to turn this attorney away, but he insisted on seeing her husband. The new Christian came down to meet him. And he said, I guess you came here with some new argument to use against me. I didn't come here to argue, the lawyer said. I came here to ask you to tell me more about your faith. I don't understand, the young man said. What changed your mind? Every time I tried to tell you about Jesus, you came up with an argument that I couldn't answer. And the lawyer responded, 
but you came up with an argument that I couldn't answer when you told me that you loved me. The lawyer responded, I couldn't argue with that. You can't argue with love. You can accept it or reject it. You can give it or withhold it. But that doesn't change the truth of God's love. The most important message that I have for you this morning is that we're called to love God with all our being and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Can anything be more important than that? Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for how your son taught his followers. How he did indeed say, speak the word to the scribes and Pharisees. Help us to understand that that word still holds in our day. That word still holds in our lives. Make us, oh God, realize that love of you and love of neighbor are what we're all about. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's join together now in singing our, our closing hymn. As we sing that hymn, we have someone who's going to honor us by joining the church today. And so I'm going to ask her to come forward as we complete that hymn. Let's stand together.
again, want to welcome you by using the words of, of uh, reception of new members for us to share. Mike, can you post it? Here we go. We rejoice to recognize you as members of Christ's local church and to give you welcome to this congregation of the United Methodist Church. With you, we renew our vows to uphold it by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service. With God's help, we will show our lives in the example of Christ that surrounded by steadfast love, you may be established in the faith and confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to eternal life. How all of you come around? And welcome Don to our congregation. You know, we, we have a new, uh, a new uh, bag here that we share that has the information about membership in our church that we, we share with our new members, but we're with the protectors of this bag now. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> welcome to the Please come around and welcome. Thank you. 